I'll just start off with a quick intro to Pear, and then we'll pass over to Pejman and Helmi. So okay, thank you all for joining us today. I'm delighted that Helmi, the CEO of Garden Health, is with us. He is sharing his story and wisdom through a conversation with my partner, Pejman, and they'll also be providing feedback on three startup pitches. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about Pear. So we partner with founders early in their journey around pre-seed and seed stage. Uh, we invest in all sectors as long as there's the potential to build a big defensible company. And we make investments predominantly in the US and LATAM. We first partnered with around half of our portfolio founders when they were still students. And then the other half comes from all different work, walks of life. Our team has grown to 14 people now. We're on our third fund with 300 million under management and partners on our team have founded and sold eight companies between us to companies including Instacart, Dropbox, Facebook, and more. And more importantly, we're very part, proud to have partnered with many iconic companies early on in their journeys, including Garden Health, where Helmi is the co-founder and CEO. Uh, for the students amongst you, I'd just like to remind you that Pair Competition will open in January next year. Um, winners of the competition get 25K uncapped safes, and there's generally multiple winners at each campus. This is specifically for student founders. Beyond that, we also have Pair Accelerator. Applications are now open for early admissions. Um, so go onto the website pair.vc forward slash accelerator to apply. And the accelerator runs for three months over the summer. We provide capital and hands-on support to just 15 teams. Uh, if you're one of those 15 teams, you'll receive exclusive attention of our seven partners. As I mentioned, founded eight companies between us. And each team is also matched with operational experts in sales, growth, marketing, and more according to your needs. We also help you recruit grade A talent through both coaching you on how, as well as helping you generate that talent pipeline so you can grow your team. And hundreds of investors attend our demo day to see less than 20 teams. So you'll receive a lot of attention on that demo day. And our fundraising bootcamp will prepare you to run an effective fundraising process and tell a big company story so you can really um, maximize on all that attention you'll be getting at demo day. We're very pleased that the teams in the summer 2020 batch have performed very strongly and they're wrapping up healthy, big seed rounds now. Now, I'm, I'm sure you're all very eager to hear from Pejman and Helmi. So with that, I'll stop sharing screen and I'll pass you over to them for a conversation. Thank you, Ian. Helmi, how are you? Pretty good, how's it going? Good, I, I was just checking during lunch and I saw you're trading your company at almost $12 billion, uh, a public company. And the fact you as a CEO of a $12 billion company, it's such an important product. You're here spending time with us and entrepreneurs tell us who you are. So I just wanna thank you so much on behalf of everyone on this call and especially my team at Pair. Um, I must admit that every time I see you, you are leaner. So I think uh, we should talk about it. What do you do that you're leaner every time that I see you? Yeah, just more walking. I mean, that's, you know, I think that's some of the benefits, the silver lining of this pandemic right now is, you know, being able to really uh, spend more time outdoors and, you know, more time with family. So all of that is, has been a positive, certainly. But you really can't lose weight without uh, eating well. And that's certainly something I focused a lot more time on uh, in, the, in the new year. So I've met my 2020 resolution, I guess. <laughs> oh, great. That's awesome. Listen, I, I think there are lots, a lot of people that are eager to, to, uh, to learn about your journey as a, as a CEO of a public company in biotech. And I want to go back at the time that you were at Stanford. So I know you grew up in Bay Area. You actually finished uh, undergrad in two and a half years and you got mastered. PhD and postdoctorate in, in double E and PhD in electronic engineering. When was it that you started to really look at biotech? What was your, your relationship with biotech? Was it at the research labs you did? And just walk us through what happened because normally you get a PhD in electronic engineering, you don't look at biotech and you did it. So just walk us through that journey. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I always 
even as a child wanted to go into medicine and help people, there was something that was a passion of mine. Uh, when I was an undergrad at Stanford, though, I looked at the process for becoming a doctor. It was, you know, 13 to 15 years. That I, I didn't have the patience for that. So I said, I'm just going to go into engineering. I got into engineering and I actually wanted to do circuit design. Um, but, you know, I think there, there are too many smart people from, I think, your country, from Iran and other places that are, that are better than me. Well, and, including my partner, Mar yeah. Maria, as you know, has PhD. In oh, yeah, yeah. She, she, was, she was one of my uh, TAs. She was one of my yeah. TAs at, at Stanford. And, you know, I just said, oh, I, I can't really compete in, in, in that uh, field. And there was a um, project uh, that was, um, you know, being uh, formed that was a uh, mix between uh, circuit design, device physics, signal processing, and biochemistry that is applied towards the genomics, towards DNA sequencing. And so that's, and, and there really weren't a lot of people who were interested in that because it was a very new field. I was actually working with Ron Davis and Mustafa Ranagi, who obviously, you know, well, and uh, I really have to credit uh, Mustafa um, for really being one of the pioneers of this interdisciplinary collaboration, really trying to bring engineers into uh, the field of uh, biochemistry and genomics and so on. And, uh, and that's how I first got exposed. And you know that aligned with kind of my passion of really wanting to help people get back into you know, the medicine side of things, the biology side of things. And, from there, you know, that was, that was during my master's. It was around the uh, year 2000, 2001. It was kind of a, a slippery slope from there. I just, you know, started getting involved. I had to graduate and finish my PhD. So I had to learn chemistry to, to get the data. And then from there, you know, I started a company with, with Mustafa that was, you know, basically my PhD work. Yeah, I, and that's Avantum, which later, um, Illumina bought it, but can, can you talk about that? What, what was that company about? And I have a question about, you know, being a CEO of that company. Yeah, so my, my PhD work was um, essentially the idea, could we leverage semiconductors for lowering the cost of DNA sequencing? Uh, if you recall, the first human genome was sequenced around the year 2000, cost about you know, $3 billion, took, you know, many years, over a decade, uh, many teams around the world to to complete that, and so clearly there was a desire to be able to sequence you know more genomes than than one um, at much lower cost. And so could we harness Moore's law, the reduction in in semiconductor um, manufacturing and some of the the efficiencies there to be able to essentially lower the cost of sequencing dramatically? And so my thesis was basically, could we build an image sensor, sort of like a camera that's in your, tele, in your uh, telephone, in your cellular phone, um, to actually sequence DNA. So there, was, there were new DNA sequencers at the time that essentially used a $100,000 camera, um, the same camera that's in the Hubble telescope. And what we found was that you really didn't need such a sophisticated uh, instrument. Um, because 90% of the light was being lost in the optics. And so if we could take a cheap sensor, put the chemistry and miniaturize it directly onto each pixel of that sensor, um, you would capture almost all the light and reduce the requirements for the sophistication of the sensor um, in, that, in that instrument. So that, that became my PhD work and became the foundation for starting uh, Avantum um, out of Stanford. And so we licensed IP from Stanford but I think the important part of it and the thing that I often tell founders is, you know, really use those opportunities to reduce technical risk and a lot of uncertainty. Um, and you're gonna, you're gonna be dedicating your life, uh, blood, sweat and tears to some new endeavor. You're gonna be taking investor money um, and your reputation is gonna be, you know, at stake for, for the next few years and hopefully it'll be successful. So make sure it's something that's worth uh, that investment of your time, which is the most precious resource. And so being able to incubate, um, you know, that, uh, that work and that research at Stanford was very critical um, to the success of, of Avantum. And it was interesting because, you know, I, I had just finished my PhD. I did a postdoc at Stanford uh, in the biochemistry department. And, you know, he asked about you know, be, becoming a CEO of that company, that wasn't a clear decision for me. I didn't know if I necessarily wanted to start a company 
um, right out of school, uh, I had really three different options that I was considering. The, the first one was becoming a professor, um, you know, going and, and, you know, I was drawn to the idea, obviously there's examples like Mustafa and, you know, my advisor, Abbas al Gamal and, and others who were very entrepreneurial at Stanford. And there are many in the double E department uh, who have the benefit of both sides of working at Stanford, but then launching a, a number of companies. And I was very drawn to that idea, but when I kind of looked at it, you know, it's, it's a difficult proposition, basically one, it's obviously a very limited positions in terms of tenured um, professorships, you know, around the country, very few places that have the, really the, the ecosystem that Stanford does. And then thirdly, you have all of the, I think, challenges of a startup. You have to raise money. You have to you know, attract talent in terms of students. And then you have all of the, the downside of being in a large bureaucratic organization. Of, you know, and so you kind of have the, the worst of both in terms of you know, startup and a large corporation in one. And so I kind of quickly decided against that, uh, that track. And so my other two options was, you know, join a, a great large company, you know, become an engineer there and, you know, kind of learn about, um, you know, how, how work is done in the, in the corporate world or start a company. And uh, I took, I would say, a, a very uh, sort of Pascal's wagers kind of view of things. I just said, you know, there's never going to be an opportunity where I can take as much risk as I can now. You know, I'm young. And worst case scenario, if I fail with the startup, at least I'll, I'll have CEO, CEO on my resume. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and, and that's my question. So, yeah. and, I, and I've seen the pattern of really good biotech company success was started by, by somebody who understand the technology, mostly PhDs, but you know, people like you spend their life at schools and labs and innovation and research. How did you develop the business skills when you started Avanto. I mean, this is the first time you're coming out. It wasn't thing that you took at school. So walk us through because this is the question. Actually, Mustafa had a talk. This is Mustafa Ronagli for, for the audience, uh, the CTO of Illumina and, and, uh, and actually co-founder of, of Avanto and a good friend of us. He, he, he said, actually, yes, technical people can really become a good CEO, especially in biotech if you learn. But just, just tell us, how did you develop those skills early on? Yeah, no, it, it, it's really having mentors like Mustafa, you know, around you, surrounding yourself with those that you can learn from. And if, if they're not readily available, seeking them out and really learning from them. You know, I'm fortunate in that my father was an entrepreneur in the, in the Valley here. He started a number of technology companies. So I had that example growing up, um, you know, someone who was a professor and was very technical, who eventually became you know, a kind of business person. So I saw that evolution obviously firsthand, but I would say that, I, and that was very instrumental, no doubt, um, but it's, you know, startup is not just about scaling the company. It's about scaling yourself faster than the company or in, in the same speed that the company is scaling. And so that's the largest, you know, challenge. I had to learn, you know, so much in the, you know, Avantum was a very quick story. It was you know, six, nine months in terms of, you know, yeah. being operational, I would say, but I probably learned, you know, more than I did in my undergrad. And <laughs> those are six, nine, you know, six, nine months, you know, how to communicate, how to pitch, you know, understanding investors, you know, mindset, how to lead people, lead teams, you know, conduct meetings that were, you know, successful, putting roadmaps. And, and, and you say I learned, when you say I learned this, what did you do? You talk to people, you just did it and fail, or you read books, you, you read books, how do you talk to your father? It's, it's all of the above. Yeah, it's all of the above. So it's reading books are obviously instrumental. It's trying things out and iterating very quickly, you know, MVP type of, you know, mentality, minimum viable, you know, products don't just refer to product development, but refer to, you know, how you conduct meetings, how you run the company and so on. And it's just continuous improvement. Um, and then, and then, you know, mentorship as well, talking to other founders who maybe are a year or two years ahead of you in terms of their cycle, really understanding, you know, what challenges they, they went from and, uh, and because it, 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 you, you triangulate from all of these different sources, the books, 
give you enough information to ask the right questions. And then it's really, I think, interacting with those who've done it that give you examples and stories that really, I think, hit home and resonate with you that, that you can apply. And then everyone has their own style. There's no perfect answer. It has to resonate with how you lead um, and how you, uh, you know, how you operate as a, as a human, frankly. Uh, your culture, your, your values, all of that is critical. And so you have to add your own flavor to whatever you read or whatever your mentors tell you. And you spend the next five, six years at, at Illumina. I just want to fast forward on Garden. Can you talk about the creation of Garden? And, and you co-founded the company with Amir Ali Talosas, who has another PhD, I think, at, at, I believe. But, but what, what um, talk about the early days. What did you see? How did you start Garden Health? Yeah, you know, I think um, it was a big, you know, another big risk to leave Illumina where, you know, we had a great position. Uh, we had just gotten to thousand dollar genome, you know, cost. And so a lot of exciting uh, progress had been made, um, really uh, something that the whole industry had been waiting for, for, for many years. But, you know, I think once again, you know, really that idea about following impact and really helping others was, was just, you know, something that both myself and Amir Ali were, were really drawn to. And we you know we said that you know it's this regret minimization kind of you know thesis, which is, you know, we see all this great innovation happening, sequencing is finally at a low enough cost that something could be done with it. I think we would have regretted not trying to move all these research technologies into the clinic and really impacting human health. Um, and so that's really where we left, you know, Luma and we decided. Look, we, we, we may not be successful. There's a high chance, you know, we may fail. But, you know, if we don't try this, you know, 10, 20, 30 years later, we're going we're gonna to regret this, you know, not, not having tried to really, um, you know, help, help cancer patients everywhere and help all of us, you know, with, you know, potentially something that's much better for, for cancer care than we have today. And so the initial, um, you know, I learned a lot from my Avantum days, you know, it was really critical. Um, I think the success of Avantum was very critical in getting Garden off the ground, um, really, you know, going to individuals like yourself who, you know, I've known for, for many years and really having those close group of uh, angel investors that really got us, you know, off the ground. And we, we raised a convertible note round uh, in the early days, I think. Back then, it was a pretty sizable, you know, now the, the round it amount. Are... Well, it was a $3 million seed convertible note, and it was uncapped. So I just don't want other entrepreneurs to hear that. <laughs> but, uh, I, I actually remember the very first time I met you, I was just so impressed. And I said, I want to invest. And then I asked you the terms. You said, page one, there's no valuation. It's uncapped. And I said, I won't do it. But Mustafa convinced me that this is the future. So I'm glad that he did. So, and I, I, I appreciate that he chose us and Bear to be an investor. In, actually, it's every single round in your company. Um, no, yeah, you what, what is, what, what are, can, can you explain what are the products you have today, Garden Health? Just yeah, walk us yeah. through and then give us some number, how many patients and, and so on. So people understand the scope of the impact you have on the cancer board. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so our, our view and you know, why we called the company Garden was really to create products that guard you against uh, cancer, against you know, illness and disease. And our vision was a simple blood test at an annual physical for early, early detection of cancer. But you know, I, I mentioned you know, we, we have certain values at Garden and one that we hold very clearly, uh, very dearly is intellectual humility. And so we just believe that you know, I think we often, uh, in, in humanity in general, underestimates the complexity of biology. And so our viewpoint was, let's start with late stage disease. Let's see if we can help stage three, stage four cancer patients get better treatments through um, genomic sequencing, through this concept uh, we call liquid biopsy. And then from there learn, you know, as we process, now we've, uh, we've tested over 150,000 cancer patients um, use the data that we unlock from that testing as our compass to lead us towards better and better performance, better and better technologies on our march towards early detection. And the company is now over eight years old. And in that time, 
Um, I think we've we've almost brought to reality really the initial vision we have. It's it's been almost uncanny how uh, close to the original roadmap um, you know we had when we started the company that we've actually been able to execute on. Uh, obviously, the details are very different, but the thirty-five thousand view is is eerily similar. And so we have a product called Garden Three Hundred and Sixty which as I said, has been used by over 150,000 cancer patients. What it does is, is you know, through a, a simple blood test, it's able to uh, really uh, provide all of the genomic information that's driving a tumor so that a physician can match the best possible precision oncology drugs to that patient. Um, without a, a test like Gardent, um, the, the previous way of getting that information was through a physical biopsy, cutting out a piece of tumor tissue, sequencing it. To just give you an example, for a lung cancer patient, a biopsy costs about $14,000, has a 19% complication rate and a 1% mortality rate. And so we've been able to replace that with a simple blood test. Um, and so clearly huge impact, it's reimbursed now by the majority of payers by Medicare. Um, so it's something that is quickly becoming standard of care for um, cancer patients today. We launched um, a product for clinical trials that's for the second market um, that, that we're, we're entering, which is for cancer survivors. There are about a million late stage cancer patients. There are 15 million cancer survivors in the US. And the product that you know we're we're um, you know attempting to commercialize there is a product that really gives those individuals what we call quantitative peace of mind. If you think about a stage two cancer patient, uh, most of them can be cured through surgery, um, but the big question is once they've gotten the surgery, you know, is did the surgeon get it all? You know, is there still any cancer left? And that's something that's very taxing. Um, that where these patients are obviously very anxious, you know, about resolving. So we have a test that, you know, essentially just a couple of weeks after surgery, if we see anything, um, there's basically a hundred percent chance that person still has cancer. So it's a very specific test um, and something that we think is going to make very significant impact for that population. And then finally, the, the third product we have which is undergoing a very large clinical trial. We're spending about 70 to $100 million in this trial. It's a 10,000 patient study. Um, our initial um, cancer type that we're going after is colorectal cancer. And so this is for early detection. So that instead of doing a colonoscopy or doing what's known as a stool test, you could potentially just take this simple blood test uh, at an annual physical uh, and, and, and really um, determine uh, that you're free and clear of colorectal cancer or that you have early stage colorectal cancer and get the appropriate uh, treatment. And it's something where the early data is very exciting and we'll finish enrollment of the 10,000 patients um, sometime next year. So it's, uh, it's something we're very excited about. Well, that's the beauty of a public company that they can share information and everybody learns. But if, if you and I have this conversation 10 years down the road, what is, what do you think the metrics or what is your biggest goal to achieve in 10 years with Garden? You know, our, our goal is really bending mortality uh, curves in cancer. Um, you know, I think when we started Garden, there really hadn't been a lot of improvement in terms of really uh, outcomes in cancer care. It's been one of the disease areas where there hadn't been a lot of improvement for the last 40 or 50 years. Last eight years, and not just because of Garden, but many other um, stakeholders in the ecosystems, there's been a bunch of new drugs that have been approved and just much more sophisticated techniques for, for treatment. And so we are starting to see some improvement in late stage disease, but unfortunately it's still too late for many cancer types. And so our vision is in 10 years, you know, could there be something that is equivalent of a statin for, uh, you know, that's paired with cholesterol for cardiovascular disease. We've seen a lot of improvement in heart disease because of statins and, and preventative medicines. Um, we believe that uh, there could be a model like that in, in cancer. Could we have a, you know, a basically a pre-cancer risk that someone, that someone you know, basically takes and is measured 
and have a very simple drug, sort of like anti-inflammatory that is able to prevent um, you know, cancers, the birth of cancers um, you know, before, before it's uh, you know, too late to, to be able to treat. And we think that is something that you know, is, is likely possible and would be an amazing kind of future because I think, I think some cancers, even if you catch them you know, uh, in a very small one millimeter in size, may be too late to, to really help that individual. So we have to catch them before they're born. Right. Um, I want to switch to entrepreneurship. If you were going to start a company today, what are the areas you were focusing? What are the problems you, you focus? And this is mo mostly for entrepreneurs listening to you to just give some direction and where you think the world needs to, to be focused in biotech or overall healthcare. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. So I, I'm definitely fascinated by the digital side of, of things. Um, you know, a lot less capital, you know, intensive, you know, potentially. Um, and a lot more opportunities than there were a decade ago. Um, I think one of the things you have to think about in healthcare is um, sometimes less the technology side, but the business side. Um, that's often, you know, the part that I would say maybe early stage investors and you know some you know early entrepreneurs don't necessarily focus on as much. But that kind of makes or breaks uh, the class of company. Um, in, a, in a sector. If you think about it, diagnostics have traditionally been a very difficult sector to invest in because the margin profile is, is typically not very good, very low gross margins, um, you know, very prone to commoditization, um, not a lot of barriers to entry, you know, unfortunately. And so, you know, I would say that we're, you know, really that I think first generation of diagnostic companies now that have kind of broken that mold um, you know, we had 72% gross margins in our last, you know, quarter and, um, and, you know, there are a bunch of other companies that, you know, are kind of in our, in our same class that, you know, for once have, have given a bright spot to the diagnostic industry. So that's one aspect is really thinking about what is the business model in terms of, you know, commercialization, what's the you know, margin profile, um, what are the barriers to, to entry? And, you know, that's why I like the, the digital space is that, you know, the margins, you know, I think are typically much better. And there's finally ways of getting reimbursement. I think you see with um, Livongo and you see you know, a number of other companies, you know, I think the success of Flatiron and so on. Um, you're seeing that, you know, companies in the digital space, whether it's uh, data or health records or digital therapeutics and so on, um, you know, are starting to be able to monetize um, their offerings and, you know, see some pretty uh, fantastic outcomes in terms of uh, those, uh, those companies. So th that's certainly an area that I think is important. Um, but it's really that, that business model innovation is sometimes more important than the, than the technology side. Great. Um, <clears throat> I think we have some questions, but I leave it at the end. Maybe Ian can walk through those questions. I have, I want to, I mean, you know, seize this opportunity and ask you about COVID. Um, do you take the test? Which one and any suggestions? What, what are your thoughts overall of where are we going? What does 2021 look like? And specifically with the test? Yeah, so we actually developed our own COVID test. Um, you know, we had, uh, we were thrown into the fire, so to speak. Uh, we had, um, an individual who actually came down with COVID very early on, I think in February. And so, you know, it was well before, uh, you know, any of the lockdowns. So we had to really scramble and figure out, you know, how would our company operate? How would we um, be able to sustain essential testing for all these cancer patients, you know, through this pandemic? And I have to really give the team, you know, a lot of credit. We put uh, policies into place very early on in, uh, late uh, February, beginning of March, that really, we really haven't changed, you know, in, in this now, you know, seven, eight months or nine months, you know, since the pandemic uh, started in the, in the US. Um, one of those, you know, policies that we quickly put into place is weekly testing of employees that are coming in. We have about a third of employees that still come into work. I go in most weeks. Um, and for them to come in, you know, they have to be tested every, every week. And I can tell you that was something that was very critical, I would say, to keeping morale high, um, giving uh, employees confidence that the workplace is very safe, 
And we did a whole bunch of other things as well, but uh, weekly testing is, is something that's uh, very important. And so what we did was we actually developed our own test, um, sequencing based uh, test. And so it has about 70 times the sensitivity of other tests out there, like the LabCorp and Quest type tests. Um, and so that was also very critical. We could find positives very early on, really before they spread too much and you know, have them quarantine. Um, so it's something that, and you know, we've been actually testing, um, you know, kind of really in line with our values at, at the company. We haven't been testing, you know, a lot of, you know, kind of privileged organizations and, and so on. We've been testing a lot of underserved communities, um, you know, migrant farm workers in the Bay Area here. Um, we've been testing them. Uh, it's, it's insane. They, some weeks they have a 30 to 40% positivity rate you know, hundreds of people. Um, they were sending tests out, you know, to, you know, some of the large national labs initially it was taking them one to two weeks to get test results back. Um, we're returning results in 24 to 36 hours. And, and so, you know, you just imagine the number of lives saved by having tests come back, you know, very quickly and telling individuals to, to quarantine. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, has really, I think, resonated with our employees and fired us up, you know, considerably that we're not only helping obviously cancer patients, but we're doing this as well. And, and we're not really trying to make a profit on it or, or anything. We're just trying to cover our costs. Right. Something, something else we're doing is testing, you know, Delaware, you know, a lot of these uh, historically black colleges and universities have had a hard time going back to schools. We've tested a number of them, including uh, Delaware State. In terms of the tests, you know, I would say, it, you know, most of the tests out there are, are reasonable. Um, you know, you certainly want a, a PCR based or you know, kind of molecular, you know, based test uh, that, that tests nucleic acids, so PCR or sequencing based. Um, but it's just important to more, it's, what's more important is just to test often. Um, you know, whenever, you know, you think that you may, may have been exposed or you're in big gatherings or you're about to go to a big gathering, you know, just get tested. Uh, that's, that's, I would yeah. say, the, the most important. And, and I know we have a presentation and I think some questions, but I, I just quick, quick your view on, on the vaccines coming out. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I think, one of the most amazing achievements in human history. If you look at, you know, the time from when we launched these trials, you know, Pfizer in May and Moderna in, in March to, you know, potentially having approvals uh, in December and just a, in a week or two, um, with you know 94, 95 percent efficacy, um, is you know I think is is fantastic. So I think things you know it may take some time to distribute and get people you know kind of the the right you know um, dosages and so on, but I think things are going to go back to normal far faster than I think anyone expects. There's going to be some things that that linger, but it's hard to mess with you know millions of years of human evolution and our need for social interaction. Oh, I just want to thank you, uh, Helmi, for what you have been doing and, and really leveraging technology to do so much good for the world. I think the world needs more people like you. I think we are paired with so much pride associated with garden health. And um, I just want to sincerely thank you and the entire team. I know this is a, this is a big, massive uh, um, effort, but the entire team and I think we have some questions, but I'm, I'm pretty sure people are waiting to pitch you and give your feedback. So I'll pass it to Ian. I just want to thank you so much again. And uh, I see PJ is excited to pitch you and then Ian is there. So uh, I'll give it to Ian to take it from here. 